you wanted to talk about Elias Pettersson today. Uh, very hot topic in the market right now. And you said you've got a lot for us on Elias Pettersson. So let's get to it. Let's talk about number 40 for the Vancouver Canucks. Yeah, so I went back and I'm working on an article. I watched back every shift of him in the playoffs so far. I did some microstat tracking. Uh, first, before I get into the takeaways, a couple of caveats. Number one, there are rumblings behind the scenes that he is playing hurt. Again, I haven't been able to officially confirm that. I'm not reporting it, but put it this way. I'd be surprised if Leas Pedersen is 100% healthy right now. Now, that's not an excuse, but just something to keep uh, in mind as we analyze his performance so far. And then what I'll do is I'll go, I've got five or six main points that I found interesting main takeaways for why he's struggling right now. I'll go one by one through them and you can jump in at the end of each point. If you want to say something, if you want to add something, or if you want me to go to the next one. So sounds good. First thing, his playmaking ability to set others up for five on five shots and scoring chances has completely fallen off a cliff. I've got him tracked with just three passes directly setting up a shot attempts and just two passes directly setting up scoring chances for the entire series at five on five. So right off the bat, he's not driving play. He's not creating looks for others. And so the logical follow-up is, is why now there are several reasons for this. The first is that it seems like his innate spatial and environmental recognition is off. What I mean by that is when Pedersen's on top of his game, he has a special ability to seemingly always know where his teammates and opponents are. Because of that, he makes these quick strike, no look passes that spring his line mates into high danger scoring areas before the opposition can react. Right now, it feels like Pedersen's radar for detecting the precise location of his teammates and opponents is off and it's leading to turnover. So there was one sequence in game one, for example, where Pedersen had the puck on the right flank on an offensive zone entry. He actually drew two defenders towards him because of that. Hoaglander was streaking down the middle lane on the rush and Pedersen had an opportunity to spring him with a pass and Hoaglander would have had a partial breakaway. In that situation, Pedersen, whose back was sort of towards Hoaglander, as he spun and made that pass, the pass was way far in front, way far in front of Hoaglander, way ahead of him. He had no chance. And then as the Canucks regrouped, Pedersen again got the puck on the right flank on an offensive entry, similar sort of play where Hoaglander was again streaking through the middle. And again, another backhand sort of no look pass. The type that he almost always makes when he's on top of his game. This one intercepted by the defender and the national started breaking out the other way. So it's a lot of these like no look spinning passes where Pedersen usually connects and he's missing like all of them. Right. And it was especially noticeable in games one and two at home. There was another one when he was in the offensive zone in the corner spun and pass to literally nobody. And it went to a vacant point and it ended the offensive zone possession. You look back at the, uh, turnover that he had that led to Colton Sissons' 3 nothing goal in um, in game two. What was that? It was like a blind pass to nobody yep. in the defensive zone. And so the simple solution, you might say, well, stop making those blind no-look passes, but that's the bread and butter of when he's at his best is he executes those passes correctly, and that's how he sets up his chances. Even the two scoring chances that I have him down as setting up, they're both from like these no look plays where he just knows where his winger or his teammate is without actually looking. So that's the first thing that uh, that stands out. That's point number one. Okay. I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but everybody's reaction to this is going to be okay. Well, how much of it is his teammates then? Well, we'll get to that. I think this part independently is not on his line mates. Like, okay. th in terms of his radar being off, him not knowing where he, where his teammates are relative to his opponents, um, his his brain is usually so sharp. He's always got that elite vision where he doesn't even need to look. And and that part of him, even when his line mates are open, he's not making those passes. Now, game five was a step in the right direction, and that's another thing to highlight. Is for a lot of these points, he started to trend better. So, for example. 
Uh, he made a neat little pass in the neutral zone to spring McKay for, for a two on one. Um, again, that was a, a quick little play before the opposition could react where Pedersen didn't even really look. And those are the targets where he hasn't, you know, consistently hit them for, for most of the part of the series. Now, if you get to his line mates, his line mates are definitely sinking him as well. Like it's both that Pedersen individually is not playing up to his ability. But one of the other points with several video clips that I highlighted was that yes, his wingers are sinking him. They're making bad decisions with the puck. They're constantly turning it over a couple of times. Pedersen has been open in dangerous shooting positions and they just miss him right in game one. Lafferty had the puck coming down the left wing. He had an open East West passing lane for Pedersen. Pedersen was loading up for a one timer and it said Lafferty passed it to Myers in the middle instead of making the full pass from one end of the rink to the other, just because it was easy. You missed that opportunity. Uh, I think Hoaglanders had a tough time controlling pucks down low, hanging onto them, making productive plays. A lot of them are just dying on a stick. And again, I thought Hoaglander looked a little bit better in game five, but that's been problematic to me. Now, the few times when we've seen Pedersen with Miller for a few shifts, you can instantly, instantly see the difference that upgraded line mates has in the sense that, JT is really good at making skilled plays on the wall in transition. So he like draws players towards him and then he can hit Pedersen with a pass in the middle to spring him for an offensive zone entry with possession. And so on one of those offensive zone entries, Pedersen drew a penalty that was in game two, I believe. And then on another one of, on another one of them um, during one of the road games, Pedersen got a pretty good scoring chance off. Whereas when he's playing with McCabe and Hoaglander, they don't have the high end skill and awareness to when they have the puck on the wall on a breakout to immediately hit Pedersen with speed streaking through the middle. And, and that's part of the reason why Pedersen isn't creating a lot off the rush in this series is the wingers just aren't quick enough to hit Pedersen in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, no comment for me on that one. Let's get to the next one. Okay, sweet. Uh, next, the precision of his finishing is off, right? So in the regular season, he hit the net on 51% of his shot attempts. So far in this series, he's got seven shots on goal despite having 24 shot attempts. So less than 30% of his shots are actually getting through to Saros. That includes just one shot on goal on eight attempts on the power play. And again, you, you look at game one, for example, he had a great drag move to get into the slot, but then missed the net. Uh, in game two, his execution with time and space on the power play was... Terrible. I mean, we all know the empty net that he missed, but even besides that, like he bobbled the puck in a dangerous spot on one play, which gave the PK enough time to recover and collapse into the shooting lane. Uh, his power play shots were getting blocked and leading to clearances. And this is another thing that stands out is even talk about his, his passing. Whenever he has the puck in dangerous situations, more often than not, he's not actually translating it into a scoring chance on net. Right, he either misses the pass, uh, he gets a shot blocked, he misses the net with a shot. Like he, even when he has the puck in a dangerous location, the precision of his next play is just off the mark right now. So that's that's another point. Anything you want to add there? No, I'm just like. I'm reading the chat and I don't want to, I don't want to give you everything the chat's saying, but one, one thing I like this one payday causing issues. I don't think it's that. I, I don't think, no. I don't think it has anything to do with that. I don't question whether Elias Patterson cares or not personally. And I, again, I know you got five points and I don't want to derail the conversation, but me personally, I don't question whether Elias Patterson cares or not. Yeah, I, I don't either. I will say like the two other points that I had, number one, Slop, sloppy puck handling and deeks. Part of the reason when the Canucks get set up in the offensive zone, why he's not as involved offensively is because he's stuck to the perimeter with the puck. And the reason he's stuck to the perimeter is because normally when he's on top of his game, Pedersen has an ability to make that tight maneuver to beat a defender, to get to the inside, to create some space. Right now, all of his deeks are getting checked. He's sloppy handling it he can't get to the inside and so that's why when the Canucks even do get it get set up for an offense his own possession so often he seems like a complimentary player on the line rather than 
when when the Canucks have an offensive zone possession with the Miller line, for example, on the ice, it's like Miller's commanding puck possession. He's able to sort of skate laps, whether it's uh, up high or down low. He's able to find seams. Um, his deeks are off. And then the other thing, again, massive improvement in this area in game five. But for the first four games, I, I thought he's been lacking urgency, oomph, and heaviness hunting for the puck. In, in both ends, like whether it's been 50-50 wall battles, I don't think he's been heavy enough. I don't think he's been creating enough turnovers as a second or third man in on the four check. Uh, down low situations where I'm like, I want you to hold on to the puck, but he gets bumped and lose, loses possession. That's been a concern. And game five, he was much better. And you immediately saw the differences. He set up two, two chances, not with his playmaking or, or his passing, but because he forced a turnover once in the first period on the four check. And then late with two minutes left, he was so quick hustling and closing down on Jeremy Lazan. And that freed the puck up for Miller to set up Besser all alone, which um, Soros robbed him on. So that's another area that, um, that I'm looking for improvement on. But I guess the, the big takeaway as we, you know, go through six or seven, seven of these points is that, Pedersen's off in so many little departments. It's not just one big thing, right? It's not one big fix that you look at and go, well, if he can fix his it's passing, then everything is going to come together. It's all of these little areas, his, his processing and decision-making with the puck, um, his vision, his puck handling and deeks, his finishing, uh, his line mates, his ability to hunt the puck, even his skating. You look at uh, NHL edge data, it shows that his speed is slightly down uh, compared to uh, last season. So it's the aggregation of all of these small areas that lead to a large cumulative effect of him mostly looking invisible and ineffective. Cindy Cat in the chat saying zero intensity. And the one thing that I want to say about what you just said, Harm, the puck battles and not being heavy on the puck. I think that's a really good way to put it. He's going down so easily, like so easily. He, you know, any sort of contact he's going down and yes, he initiates it sometimes, but man, you, you got to be stronger on your skates at the end of the day. No doubt. And again, it's, that's why game five was the first time where, where you were like, okay, from a physical standpoint, from a battle level standpoint, that's what you want to see. Right, that's the level that he has to play at to be more impactful. The finishing still wasn't there, the bottom line production wasn't there. You're going to need that in Game Six, uh, or if they get to Game Seven, you're going to need it there too. But in the absence of, like, put it this way, Pedersen doesn't have the speed or the dominant physical frame to bully guys from a physical perspective. Like he doesn't have McDavid or McKinnon speed. He leans on his brain and the precision of his technical skills to do his offensive damage when those when, when his calibration is off in those areas then he needs to be more assertive away from the puck he needs to be more impactful again forcing turnovers holding on to pucks to at least make sure you're helping the team in some other way even if you're not creating scoring chances every shift Canucks Conversation is live Monday through Friday, every weekday at 2 p.m. over on the Canucks Army YouTube channel. Make sure you like, subscribe, and interact in the YouTube live chat every day with us, folks.